Welcome back to Fossil Ridge Games. Today we are going to talk about Dune Imperium, specifically the Rise of Ix expansion. This is going to be a little bit of a combo video. I'm going to give you some tips and tricks and also just the basics of how to play this new expansion. This video will highlight several of the major changes made to this game. First up will be the shipping track. Um, next, we're going to be talking about the Ixian tech upgrades, which will include a short summary of the Dreadnoughts and how this new combat unit functions in the game. And then finally, there have been additional cards added to Dune Imperium in which you have the infiltration sort of um, aspect on these cards, and then you also have the unload ability. So we're going to be talking about all of this during this video. I'm going to walk you through first how the shipping track works, and then I'm going to give you some tips and tricks on how to maximize this new part of the game. So first and foremost, we have two different new locations that you can go to. The one on the top, please notice that you have to have two influence with the spacing guild before you can go here. Um, next up, we have smuggling. So the first things we're, we're going to talk about is this new icon. This is a freighter icon. Now, when you get one of these freighter icons, it allows you to move your tracker one space up the track or allows you to return it back to the start. So as an example, if we place one of our agents on smuggling, it will allow us to move our purple token up the shipping track one location. Now, if we then on a subsequent turn um, place our agent on this space again, we can either advance the shipping track one location or we can return the marker back to the start and we can then get the benefits for each tier that we've advanced to. As an example, if you reach the top of the track, let's say you're at the top of the track at the end of your turn, and then maybe next turn you go ahead and step on the smuggling uh, location again, this allows you to reset your pawn all the way back to the bottom and you get to cash in all of these rewards in any order as you see fit. This is a fantastic way for you to reap the benefits of all of that interstellar uh, trade and transit. Here's a, a pretty easy tip and trick for you when you start playing with the shipping track. Obviously, you're going to need two influence from the spacing guild to utilize the top space, which is inter interstellar shipping. But let's say you place your agent on this marker. You can do one of two things. What's cool about this is that you have two of these icons and you can play them both. So if you have nothing on the shipping track, you can advance two spaces. Alternatively, you can use the first icon to move to the first location on this on this track. Then you can use the second icon to bounce your way back down. So this is a really important way for you to be earning Solaris. This is basically the money in Dune Imperium. So if you look on this space right here, you can get either Solari or Spice. So what's interesting about this space is that it has a five and then there's little ones next to it. And what that means is that if you are the active player that moves to this location and then you cash this in, you can take five Solari, which is going to be the big token in the game. Now, all of your opponents in the game, however, are also going to gain a Solari, but they're only going to gain one Solari. So you gain five and they gain one. That's kind of an interesting mechanic um, and it makes you kind of hesitant sometimes to go that space, but getting the five Solari kind of outweighs your opponents getting one. Now, what else you see on this track is this is an either or, so you get either the Solari or the Spice. At this location right here, you're gonna gain two troops and then you can increase your influence on any of the tracks, one location. Now, at the very top of this card is something pretty cool. This is going to be your ability to purchase Ixian technology at a minus two Spice discount. So I'm going to go into a little bit later what that's going to mean, but you can purchase some of these tech upgrades and you will be able to purchase it at a minus two. So let's say you wanted to buy the spy satellite, it would only cost you two spice as opposed to four because you hit this top location over here, which is pretty interesting and pretty cool. So we just learned the basics of the shipping track. So now here is where I want to interject some kind of cool strategy and tips that you can maximize the shipping track. So first and foremost, 
Um, one of the places that you can go on the game board is for the Spacing Guild. And as you can see, early on in the game, you will have access to full space. You won't have enough spice to purchase a Highliner and all the troops that go with it. But at the beginning of the game, what you want to do is you want to focus on getting two influence. You want those two influence so that you can activate the interstellar shipping portion of the game board. So let's go ahead and pop back over to that. So here's what I'm talking about. This one right here, you have to have two influence so you can activate this. And remember, in here, there are two freighter icons. This is extremely important, and it's going to be making this marker move even further, and you get more out of each agent that you place on the board because it's going to be moving two locations as opposed to one for every single activation that you put an agent on that track. So let's go ahead and pop back over. We're going to go back to the Spacing Guild location. Now, when you start a game of Dune Imperium, you have some limited access to cards that allow you to activate faction. So here they are. There's first Diplomacy and then Seek Allies. And you notice the one on the right, you have to trash it once you use it. But both of these have Spacing Guild icons actually located on them. So something that I kind of recommend doing is that in the early portion of the game, as people are starting to get their engines going, go ahead and pop down, use one of these cards. So first use, let's say, Seek Allies. We go ahead and uh, trash this card, we remove it from the game. We're gonna pop our agent onto Fold Space. Fold Space is going to yield literally the most versatile card in the game for placing agents. It's Fold Space. You get to draw a card, but you can go anywhere, literally anywhere, um, pretty much on the game board. So that's important. This is then going to cycle through into your draw deck. Now, what else is going to happen is your faction marker is going to go up one location. Now, kind of on your first turn, you may or may not have a Diplomacy or a Seek Allies card, um, but you want to use these early on in the game so you can get up to your two influence on the Spacey Guild uh, sort of tracker. So on the next turn, um, if you can do it, Remember that you have either another Diplomacy or Seek Allies card. Sometimes you get these both in your opening hand, or sometimes you get them in your second hand. But try to spend these early on in the game. Now, if you are lucky and you hit Fold Space on your second turn as well, and you know sometimes people are going to be competing for these resources, which is fine, this is going to move and you're going to gain you know, essentially one of the victory points in the game. But this is then going to unlock the interstellar um, shipping location on this map and then it allows you to start placing your agents here. This is extremely important for you to start making money. I'm going to walk you through what that means. Why is money important in Dune Imperium? What do you get out of it? Why do you want the Solaris that are generated from the shipping track? Plain and simple, this is where a lot of the power in your engine comes from. So first and foremost, we have the High Council space if you have five Solari, and remember five Solari isn't gonna be that hard to get now if you have two influence with the Spacing Guild. If this occurs, you can become part of the High Council. You're gonna place, you know, obviously your agent here. You're gonna spend your five Solari. And then from this point onward, you get two influence every single turn when you do your reveal step. So you can buy cards from card row and buff up your draw deck significantly faster than your opponents if you have a seat at the High Council. Secondarily, and this is extremely important to your engine, is the Swordmaster space that you place your agent on. You only start a game of Dune Imperium with two agents. Now, if you purchase the Swordmaster location, you get your third agent. This allows you a lot of versatility. It allows you to then go to three different locations on each of your turns, and you can start outpacing your opponents because you're going to be literally soaking up more resources than they will be able to do. The third aspect of why you want Solaris comes down to Dreadnoughts. So Dreadnoughts are going to cost you roughly three Solaris to purchase, and these are going to be um, sort of a military unit that you can use over and over again. The troops 
are sort of like one use. So once they're used on the game board, they are removed. The dreadnoughts will keep cycling back and forth and you can use them over and over again. And they're a little bit more powerful than the troops. So plain and simple, if you want to start outpacing your opponents, you're gonna wanna go for the shipping track, okay? And by having interstellar shipping with the two influence with the spacing guild, this allows you to place your agent here you can go up the shipping track and then back down and immediately cash in and get five Solari. On the next turn, you can do the same thing, you know, if this position is open. Now remember that this position is going to be open because it's going to be harder to get to because of the two influence. So if you do this early in the game, your opponents won't be able to do it because they don't have the two influence. Then on your next turn, you can pop in here again. You could hit this and cash in. Now you've got essentially 10 Solari in two turns. You can do a lot with that. So back over to this location right here, you could either uh, spend some of that Solari to get on the High Council, or early on in the game, you could get your third agent, which is a huge bonus, it's a huge buff. So one of the strategies that I'm gonna recommend is going for sort of the Spacing Guild slash trade track, the shipping track, early on in the game. And then in turn, that's going to give you an extra um, agent in the game as well. Really cool strategy, but you gotta know that it's there. And once you do it a couple times, it becomes second nature to you. Next up is the right-hand side of the board. Specifically, there is a new board added for the Ixian technology. There are a couple of spaces in which you can place your agents. We have tech negotiation and the dreadnought space. So we kind of just went through an overall scheme for acquiring a lot of money and resources. So I'm gonna zoom in just a skosh, and what we're gonna see is that the Dreadnought is gonna cost you three Solari to purchase. So each one of the colors in the game, you can purchase up to two Dreadnoughts. You can't purchase any more than that, so it is capped at two. Now, the other thing that we see right here is tech negotiation. So all of this stuff in this portion of the board is for Ixian technology and dreadnoughts. So as a case in point, we see some new icons and some symbols. So I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in and move it up just a little bit so we can see this. This symbol right here means that we can purchase any of these tech upgrades for minus one spice. Please notice that they all have a spice cost associated. That's how many spice you need to uh, expend to purchase this upgrade. So in this case, if you take your agent, we're going to take the purple agent and stick it right on the space, you can either purchase one of these technologies for one less, or what you can do is take a troop, and we're going to place it on this space right here. These can be used in the future to deduct the cost of any of these tech upgrades that you land on. So that's pretty fantastic. You can either do minus one currently, or you can place a troop in here. So what's interesting is that if you place a troop over here, you cannot place it onto the board. You only have 12 in the entire game, so you need to be strategic on how you use them. You can thus use your troops to decrease the amount of cost of one purchase of one of these upgrades. So as an example, um, I'm just gonna go ahead and throw two troops on the board. Let's say I have two purple troops, I take my agent, and I stick it on, let's say the dreadnought space. This will allow me to purchase a dreadnought. Obviously I need to expend the three Solari and then I can buy one of these Ixian tech upgrades. If I have two troops down here, I can remove these two troops to reduce the cost of this Ixian upgrade by two spice. Um, so I can buy this one for two, this one for one, or this one for two. So this portion of the board is extremely important and there are some really cool aspects in the game. So next what I'm going to go into is some of the strategies that impact this part of the board and some things that you can do to really take advantage of these new upgrades to the game. All right, so let's walk through why you want these upgrades. So I went ahead and I just flipped a couple of these cards upright so we can take a, a look at them. Um, so the first one I'm gonna do is just grab this one in the middle and notice it says on your reveal turn, you can add one persuasion point. So this is going to decrease the cost of you purchasing you know, any one of the cards from card row by one point. So that'd be pretty fantastic. So we're gonna go ahead and, and reduce the cost of this one to four. Now, this is gonna occur every single turn. 
So a lot of these upgrades will give you a bonus. So case in point, we're gonna drop down and look at the bottom upgrade right here. Round start, you're gonna draw a card. Also in the end game, you can gain a victory point if you have at least two spice must flow cards. So you know, as an example, these wonderful cards that cost nine to bring out, they're really hard to get. Um, you could gain an extra victory point if you have two of these at the end of the game. So when you are putting together your overall strategy, it's easy to get distracted by what's going on across the entire board. But just be aware that just one or two of these Ixian tech upgrades can go a long way over the course of the game. Some of these are really fantastic. Some of them will give you, um, I don't know, I'll start flipping through, see what else is in here. Um, you know, this one's going to give you three influence on all four of the influence tracks. Um, for end game, you get a victory point, so that's pretty cool. That's something that you can kind of surprise your enemies at the end with. You know, a lot of this stuff, when you purchase it, it's going to give you an intrigue card, and you can just kind of look through this very quickly. This one, wind traps, is when you fight and win a battle, you're going to gain a water. Also, when you buy the wind traps, you're going to gain a water resource. So if you start kind of thinking about the long game, the earlier you purchase these Ixian upgrades, the more that you can utilize them over the course of the game. Now, remember that all of these are going to be sort of spice purchases. So you're going to have to be pretty aggressive on the main board when it comes to a lot of those spice locations. So I'm going to go ahead and just drop the camera um, somewhat into the middle of the board. And you can look, so just pull this off. You know, you're going to be getting spice, obviously, during the maker's turn. Spice is going to also be building up on the board in different locations. So you can just do a couple harvests of spice and then use it to cash it in for these upgrades. But as I said before, you want to do it sort of early on in the game so you can utilize these resources over and over and time and time again. It is time to fight in Dune Imperium. Something that we just mentioned and we just talked about is that for a cost of three Solari, you can go to the Dreadnought space, which is in the upper right-hand corner of the board, and then you can use it to purchase a Dreadnought. This is this sort of spaceship-looking icon that appears in the game. Now, what makes the Dreadnought different from a nor normal sort of infantry is that once you use the infantry, it's removed from the game. It goes back to your supply. The Dreadnought itself... First and foremost, it is worth three battle points when you're fighting a conflict, as opposed to two. So each troop is, t is typically worth two, as evidenced by this icon on the map. So the Dreadnoughts are going to be worth three points in the conflict. Not only that, they cannot be removed from the game. They can simply cycle... Uh, back and forth from different locations in the game. So some of the battlefields and the places that you can win in the game. So there are three locations in Dune Imperium that if you win certain battles, it gives you access to sort of taking over a location, which is kind of cool. So um, kind of as an example, I'm going to go ahead and throw this card into the middle of the screen. This is called the Siege of Carthag. If you notice, there is this icon right here present in the game. So let's say we're the purple player and we win the conflict. Now Carthag ends up with a flag on it. And what that means is that any time an agent goes on that space, this could be your agent or an enemy agent, you're going to score one Solari. Now where does the Dreadnought factor into this? So as an example, instead of the purple player owning Carthag, we're going to assume that the red player, or I'm sorry, the green player, has actually taken over Carthag in this point in the game. And then we're going to throw a red marker on Arakeen, just to the right. So I'm going to sort of pan down, and notice we have our Dreadnought. So let's say we win a conflict. I'm just going to mock up a conflict. Maybe we have two troops, and then the yellow player throws down two troops. But our Dreadnought is going to be worth three points, and then our troops are going to be worth um, two points apiece. So we're going to win this conflict. These troops are removed. The purple troops are removed. Now, if we as the active player win one of these battles, you can move this to any of these battle locations. So kind of a cool thing about it is that it covers up the flag underneath. So if the green player has taken over Carthag, 
and any sort of agent is now placed on here, the purple player gains the reward, not the green player. So consequently, you can also take over the red location and let's say you play your own agent to that space, you're gonna gain that one Solari. So that's if you win a conflict, let's drop it down and see what happens if you lose a conflict. You know, let's say our Dreadnought shows up and the yellow player is just absolutely out of control for this conflict and he drops in you know five troops so he has a total power of 10 and we only have a three now what happens at the end of that conflict all of the yellow troops are going to be removed from the board now this dreadnought it does not get removed from the board it goes back into the supply this is pretty cool this troop cannot be removed from the board it can either bounce back and forth between the active area it can be in the garrison or it can take over one of these sites as we've seen before so like the imperial basin is also a location with a flag icon on it so think of the dreadnought as a reusable troop so let's kind of put everything together that we've learned so far so we learned pretty early on that we want to use the shipping track I'm going to go ahead and just zoom in real quick to this location. And notice that we can gain five Solari. Then notice just to the right we have the Dreadnought space. So if we move here with our agent, I can spend three of the Solari to purchase a Dreadnought. And this Dreadnought is going to be a reasonable troop over the course of the whole game. Once again, with, you know, kind of in conjunction with the Ixian upgrades, and then everything that we've learned about getting a seat on the High Council and the Swordmaster, the earlier you get all of these things, the more that you can utilize it. So think about getting a Dreadnought early on in the game. You can really bully your opponents very early on by using this Dreadnought literally over and over again to get those three battle points in the conflict. And you can do that um, turn after turn. Now, where the sweet spot is, is that if you have two of the Dreadnoughts purchased so you can be cycling these dreadnoughts. You can be taking over locations, you know, kind of locking out your opponent. So you can use one to block. Then the extra one goes back into your garrison at the bottom. So if you are kind of wanting to play a game that's more combat oriented, more combat centric, you can start out by getting some Solari and then immediately getting a Dreadnought or the second Dreadnought and immediately just start bullying your opponents. Next up is the Infiltrate mechanic. I'm gonna go ahead and just point to one of the cards. You can see that that is the Infiltration icon and it can be used in two different ways. One, if you just simply want to use it to go to a purple location, you can just spend it and place one of your agents on that location. Or number two, if there's an enemy agent, I'm gonna place the green one down and let's say that we are the purple player even though that spot is already taken by an agent, infiltration allows you to place an agent also at that spot, and then you can get the benefits of that spot. This is a pretty cool mechanic, and I think it adds quite a bit to the game. Now, please note that if you already have, let's say, you know, let's say we're the green player and we play Bounty Hunter, this does not allow me to place a second agent at a spot that I already have placed an agent at. I can only place an agent at an open location or a location that already has an enemy agent present. Next, we're going to move on to a new game mechanic. This is going to be the unload game mechanic. What you're gonna find is that at the bottom of some of the cards in the expansion, you're going to see these icons. Let's see if that can go into focus. So one of them is a down arrow and the other one is the trash card icon. And if you look, it's pointing over to some sort of effect. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this down onto the board and we're gonna have just a quick conversation about how this works. So first up, if you do a normal reveal action using this card, you're gonna trigger the bottom of the card. I'm gonna go ahead and just cover up the unload um, icon. So this would trigger if you just do a normal reveal action. Now, where unload gets kind of interesting is that you can trigger this effect also if you do one of two different things. This new discard icon, it is an orange rectangle with an arrow pointing down. So as an example, if you trigger 
a um, discard action somewhere in the game, and then you get rid of Boundless Ambition, and Boundless Ambition goes into your discard pile, it will trigger the wording at the bottom of the card. In addition to that, you also see that there is the trash, the card icon next to it. So as an example, I'm gonna go ahead and go over to our normal sort of like fashion track. And I was gonna zoom in on selective breeding. This is a space that didn't see too much play in the last version of the game. But as the game designers kind of move forward with kind of creating some new mechanics, I think this is a little bit better sort of option to understand. So for selective breeding, you can now do a card discard action. So, or a trash action rather. So if you look at this card, if we do that and we trash this card right here, we could acquire a card that costs five or less. So not only are you constrained by doing a reveal action, um, you have two additional options. So the selective breeding space on the board, it does cost two spice. It sees additional play in the expansion of Rise of X. So here's kind of the example. I'm gonna go ahead and throw down an agent on this. I'm going to then do a trash card action. And as a result of this, I trash this card, which I wish would go into focus. Um, and then I can acquire a card that costs five or less. In addition to that, it allows me then to draw two additional cards. So some of the game mechanics that you didn't experience before are now a lot more pertinent and they are a lot more useful. So selective breeding is definitely a better option. It allows you to kind of prune your deck. It keeps it kind of slim because you're actually doing trash actions. In addition to that, it allows you to build up two additional draw cards, which allows you to purchase cards from card row at the end of your turn. To just fully cover a lot of the strategies that are present in this game, I'm going to go ahead and go over sort of an old favorite sort of loop that you can do when you're playing this game. This doesn't have anything to do with the new expansion. It's just simply a quick strategy to get you to understand sort of the Fremen and the flow of water in the game. So we're looking at the bottom left-hand corner of the game board, and this is where the Fremen faction are located. So first up, um, I want you to notice that this space still suits generates water, and gaining water in the game is, is a fairly rare commodity. It's kind of hard to get. So the easiest place that you can get it is located on the still suits and also notice that this is a combat marker as well. So if you want to sort of open up with a combat centric um, sort of play style, this is a loop that you can do. So kind of on your first turn, if somebody hasn't taken still suits and if you have a faction card, go ahead and play it. You're going to get a water resource, um, you know, for going there. So we can go ahead and just put this off to the side right there. And then next turn, or even on the same turn, if you have a second faction card, um, go ahead and then basically spend this water icon and then you know put your other agent onto that spot. You're gonna obviously move up the track. Um, two spaces, you're gonna get that victory point. But what's really important about this strategy is that it unlocks a space on the board. So you will need to influence with the Fremen faction to unlock Siege Tabor, which is located up here on the map. So this is just a much better spot for obtaining water. And if you look at it, it's, a, it's an easy icon to have. It's just a purple card, which gets you up to Siege Tabor. You're gonna gain one troop and then you're going to gain one water. Now, what you're gonna do with that water is eventually then start spice harvesting, but you need a, an easy way to get water. Now, if you have two influence and your opponents don't, they won't be able to go to Siege Tabor. So it'll be uncontested. You can draw upon this space as often as you want. Please also note it gives you a, a troop and it's a combat uh, marked space which allows you to place troops in the conflict. Next, what I'm gonna do is go ahead and just pop this out a little bit and we're gonna take a quick look at spice harvesting and spice production on the map. So there's two locations in which you're going to gain a pretty decent amount. So we have the Great Flat and we also have the Haga Basin. So these two spaces on the board though, they require you to consume water. So the Great Flat 
it's going to make you spend two water to go here, and then the Hagen Basin is going to be one. Something else that I want you to notice is that since water is kind of a, a tough commodity to get, at the beginning of the game, and even kind of in the middle and end of the game, you won't be able to get a lot of the water that you need to harvest this spice. So this spot is going to be really hard to get to, but since you've unlocked Siege Tabor, you can then start building up the water and then go to these spaces. So as the Great Flat and the Haga Basin um, kind of linger on in the game, at the end of each turn, there's a Maker's Phase, and you're going to be start adding spice icons to it. So realistically, kind of the first time or first opportunity you're going to get to harvest at the Great Flat, it's going to have an additional two, if not three extra spice located here. So if you were to take an agent, let's say we take the purple agent, spend two water, we could then gain six spice. That's a lot of spice, um, but it also unlocks kind of an interesting place to go. And this is going to be with the spacing guild. So just realize at this point, maybe we're sort of in the middle of the game and, I've, and we've harvested six spice. You say, okay, well, what does that get us exactly? And this leads us back to the spacing guild. And there's a spot on here called the highliner. You're going to spend six. I'm going to go ahead and just zoom in a little bit. You're going to spend six spice. And um, obviously you need to do a spacing guild faction marker, and you're going to place, you know, one of your agents on this. Now notice something interesting that you get. You're going to get five troops, which is awesome. It's a combat space, so you can dump those troops directly into the conflict. That's going to allow you to win a lot of battles, and it's going to allow you to win the battles on your terms just by sheer force of numbers. You can throw a lot of troops in, but please notice these two icons right here. You're going to gain two water. What do you do with that water? You're just going to keep um, harvesting spice on the board. You know, and obviously these are going to fluctuate. So if you do harvest here the next turn, it's going to be depleted. But you kind of get where I'm going with this, is that you can kind of get set up for a loop that occurs over and over again. Now that I have the two water, I can go back to the Great Flat or the Haga Basin um, pretty quickly and pretty easily because I've gained those resources. Then when I built up enough spice, I can go back to the Highliner and rinse and repeat. I can drop more troops onto the table, win another conflict, then I get the two water and I just keep going over and over and over again. So this is a kind of a cool loop. This existed in the first game, but if you haven't seen this loop, it's something to watch out for. When you're playing newer players, they don't see all of these strategies because they take turn after turn after turn to unlock and get going. So if they don't see it, it's hard for them to counter it and you can win a lot of conflicts and get those victory points. So I saved the Emperor's Faction for the end of this video because you have to have learned a lot of the other strategies to employ this one. So something that I routinely see, especially with players that have been um, into this game for a while, there is a strategy in which they mix the Bene Gesserits with the Emperor Faction track for sort of a blended playstyle approach. So the first thing that I want to mention is that when we started this video, we talked about Solari generation and why we want to do it. It gives you a seat at the High Council. You can get your extra agent from the Swordmaster space, and it also allows you to purchase Dreadnoughts. So I want you to think of all of this as we kind of dive into this section of the video. Then from our last um, section of the video, we learned that spice production can allow us to purchase troops with the Highliner, but something else it can do is allow you to purchase the Conspire space under the Emperor's Faction track uh, right here. Now, if you look at the rewards for this, um, you're going to get troops, you're going to get intrigue cards, and you're going to get the Solari. So think of this as a blended approach. Like, why would you want to do this? Well, I'm not going to get a ton of troops, but I still get two troops. I'm not going to get necessarily a ton of Solari, but five Solari is a, a pretty hefty payoff for going to the space just one time. In addition to that, we have this Intrigue card as well. So this is why it's a blended approach. I can still build up money for the High Council, the Swordmaster, and Dreadnoughts by using the Solari. I can build troops and Intrigue cards. Secondarily, where this um, sort of strategy takes shape as well is that players that do this often will send their agents to the secret space. This is 
literally one of the most highly contested spots on the entire board when we play. It's extremely rare it's not taken in the first or second turn as it starts cycling around the table uh, for each game round. So to be clear on this, why do you want entry cards? Entry cards are going to give you access to combat cards, which allow you to win um, those conflicts with less troops. In addition to that, it gives you plots, which typically give you extra resources. So this is why it's a blended approach. You're going to this space right here. You know, you can get some faction with the Bene Gesserits and eventually gain some victory points, but you're getting those entry cards to make each of your turns more potent, whether it's a conflict or it's you're placing an agent and you're playing a plot card, you're basically supercharging and powering up those actions. So I've seen people do this and, uh, you know, in conjunction with this, I'll show another spot on the board. And this is Carthag, so I'm going to go ahead and um, set the camera and then zoom in on this. So once again, this is a nice blended space. We're going to gain a troop. It's a combat-oriented location, so you can help with conflicts, and it also gives you that entry card. So when players utilize this strategy, they constantly have a massive supply of entry cards, and they're smart enough to spend them so they don't get taken from them. In addition to that, they are building up troops. They can win conflicts on average with less troops because they have those conflict cards in their hand. So putting everything together, if you want sort of a blended sort of approach to playing the game that literally gives you a pretty strong number of victory points every time you play, think about trying the Bene Gesserit Emperor faction and going go sort of like middle of the road. You're literally collecting almost anything to make you successful but you're not being excessive in any one um, sort of strategy. I hope you've learned some cool tips and tricks to do an Imperium. The one thing I wanna stress above all other things is that if you take all of the tips that I've given you, you don't ever have to just employ one strategy, but always keep your eyes open and understand what strategies are out there. You can counter your players, you can counter other players. In addition to that, you can kind of mix and match as different spaces come open and you know that you can make these progressions and you can make these long-term strategy goals when you're playing the game. If you don't have a good foundation and the basics of it and how to get to where you need to go, it can be a little bit confusing and a little bit frustrating when you play this game. So I wanna thank you for watching this video and as always, have fun gaming.